Beaumont First Assembly of God. I'm Pastor Warren Hoyt, and I'm very happy to be with you here today, even though it's only by video. Pastor Bob asked me during the week if I would uh, bring a message to you by video. We wanted to do it on Facebook Live, but then we thought there might be some complications and it might not work that well. So I, I told him, you know, I thought I'd record it ahead of time and just send it out. And so, uh, you know, glad to be with you today. I understand Bob and Linda are under the weather and uh, some of the rest of your members are as well. And so very sorry to hear that. And um, I'm honored to be able to to try to bring the word of God to you today and to be with you in your service. I wish we could do it live or by Zoom or something so that we could at least um, see each other. But anyway, we'll have to do it this way. And so I'm just uh, speaking by faith to you out there without being able to see any of you, which is kind of strange because actually behind my camera, my window looks out at uh, kind of the swamp down here in Florida. You wouldn't believe it's like a green uh, jungle out there. Maybe I'll put a picture on and show you. But anyway, um, we're doing this, of course, because of all the crazy times that we're in, this pandemia and everything. And and it's really been a crazy time, hasn't it? 2020 was crazy, and it, and it hasn't ended yet. The elections, the uh, riots, the upheavals. We're in times of greater uncertainty than I can remember in my 66 years. I don't know about uh, some of you. And I'll be honest with you, um, many uh, times during this last year, I've felt rather discouraged about how our country's going. And I've been wrestling with God and praying and praying with my folks over here about uh, just exactly how we should uh, face these times and, and navigate through these times. How would God have us live? And um, uh, how would he have us witness as we're uh, going through all this kind of stuff? And, um, you know, like we can't even meet together. We have to meet through, you know, technology and stuff like that. And of course, there's some advantage to that, isn't there? Because churches have been more online than ever before in all of history. And I think overall, it's got to be something positive that probably uh, more pastors are preaching like this and maybe more messages are getting out. Maybe some folks are watching them who wouldn't normally come to church. I hope that's the case anyway. And so I hope that um, the gospel is being spread abroad more now through all of this um, than ever. And, um, you know, I hope it has a positive effect. Um, in my own uh, experience here uh, doing these things on, on Facebook and on video and all, I've had actually people, in, uh, I have a missionary friend who's in Malaysia who watched one of my uh, videos and I have people in California and other states. I live in Florida. So that's kind of exciting that we can do that. And, of course, we know there's no distance with God, right? Uh, he's omnipresent. He's a spirit, so he's everywhere. And he's with each of us, wherever we may be. And whenever we meet together in his name, he promised to be in our midst. And so that's the wonderful good news that we have about our God. Now, I'd like to share with you some thoughts from God's word this morning. And in the presentation, I'm going to be using three main scriptures, and I just want to mention them up front for you. I'm going to be looking at Haggai 2, verses 6 and 7, John 16, 33, and I'll end up with 1 Peter 3, 15. And I'll just uh, mention them up front because when I get to them, I'm just going to uh, mention them uh, kind of quickly. So Haggai 2, 6 and 7, John 16, 33, and 1 Peter 3, 15. Now, the Haggai verse says that in the last days, God will surely shake the heavens and the earth so that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And so I, I use that verse and, and touch on that because surely we can all admit that this has been a time of shaking, right? It's really been a time of shaking, shaking of our whole nation, shaking of the whole world. And times of shaking, one thing I notice about them is that they make you sort of reevaluate where you're at. I suppose you would admit that with me. You would agree to that with me. Uh, it makes you wonder what's really important. What do I really believe? What am I really supposed to be about? And so, um, you know, Haggai 2, 6, and 7, there's been a whole lot of shaking going on, right? 
But the thing is, how are we supposed to interpret that and interpret life in general in these days? And what kind of guidance does the Bible give us regarding this kind of thing? You can hear all kinds of opinions about it. On the one hand, there are a lot of preachers who will just tell you, hey, don't worry, don't fear. Everything's going to turn out just fine. God won't let anything bad happen to us. And many people will quote uh, Psalm 91, for example, you know, uh, those who abide under the shadow of the Almighty will, you know, be delivered from no any pestilence or the arrow that flies by day and so forth. And uh, people will say you can claim these kind of promises as faith promises, and that'll sort of ward off any evil. So if you're a Christian, you, you don't need to worry because nothing bad can possibly happen to you. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing you expect from a pastor, right? I mean, tell the people good news. Tell them things they want to hear. Um, but to me, it kind of comes across uh, like a platitude. Like, you know, when you hear that uh, a reporter says, the Pope called today for world peace. Well, what would you expect the Pope to call for? World war? <laughs> he calls for world peace. All right, that's nice. That's what you'd expect. But how real is it to call for world peace? Is there ever really going to be world peace? I mean, we're not for war, but be honest. Because some guy called for peace and said we should all get along, is that going to is that going to really work? Somewhere near my house, I saw a church marquee that said Jesus gives hope and encouragement. And again, that's absolutely true, but doesn't it sound kind of like a platitude sometimes? It sounds nice, but it's kind of Pollyannish. Remember Pollyanna? There's a movie about Pollyanna and a book and on. The idea of Pollyanna is everything's wonderful. You know, you just look at the world through rose-colored glasses. They're there. Everything's going to be fine. And so, yeah, Jesus gives hope and encouragement, but like how? And how do you get hold of that, right? <laughs> Practically. Platitudes sometimes. They're not that helpful. Because I always, I don't know, I'm sort of a questioning person and thinking kind of person. And so I'll say, you know, based on what? Like, things are going to be fine based on what? Who says things are going to be fine? We all know that bad things can happen to so-called so good people, right? And good things can happen to so-called bad people. You can't just say it never happens that way. Good people get good things, bad people get bad things. That's the way it is. No, that ain't the way the world works. Um, and likewise, just because you're a Christian, it's simply not true that nothing bad can happen to Christians. Just because we love Jesus, everything's going to be wonderful and great. Why do I say that? Well, because Jesus himself said it. He promised the opposite of that. You know, just in spite of what a lot of TV preachers will tell you. He said, and this is my second verse, John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. That word means affliction, burdens, troubles, pressures, difficulties. Jesus never said, come to me and I'll fix everything and you'll never have any worries or problems. Preachers might tell you that he, that he says that or that he'll do that. You know, solve, he'll solve all your problems. Come to Jesus. You'll have the best year ever. He didn't say that, folks. He said, I promise you in the world you'll have tribulation. We need to have a mindset that is biblical, that agrees with what the Bible teaches us. And Jesus did not give us a Pollyannish uh, platitude filled book that tells you everything's going to be fine. Now, for several years in my Christian life, I was in churches that taught those kind of things. And that's why I kind of react against that. Uh, we were told in those churches that if we had faith, we could be protected. It'd be sort of like, you know, your faith would be like a, a force field, like in a you know, science fiction movie or something. You could be in this force field. You can be in this bubble. You have this deflector screen, and it'll keep anything from, uh, from touching you, anything bad anyway, right? And in fact, we were even told that we were to exercise faith like a sort of a force. It's, there's a force of faith, and if you use your faith the right way, it becomes a, a force field, a deflector screen, and It'll keep bad things away, and, and uh, only if you fail to stand in faith will things ever possibly go wrong. Look, 
I don't want you to misunderstand me because I know it's easy to misunderstand. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for protection or believe God to protect you from harm and so forth. It's absolutely right to pray that and uh, to pray for guidance so that, you know, the Lord will help you miss the kind of the, the landmines out there that you could step on, you know, guide me, Lord, so I don't do the wrong thing, so I don't go the wrong way, the wrong place. It's perfectly right and biblical to pray for healing when we get sick. In fact, it, you know, we're, we're told to do that. It's the, like the bread of life, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Well, that includes healing and so forth when you're sick. <clears throat> it's right to pray for our needs to be met, whatever they may have. It's right to pray because Jesus said to do so, to be to, that we would not be led into difficult testing. Lead us not into temptation, right? And he even said in another place that during the time of tribulation, uh, we should pray that our flight wouldn't be in winter so that uh, if we had to flee persecution, it wouldn't be in winter, so it wouldn't be too hard on us. Well, that, see, it's all right to pray those kind of things. What I am saying, though, is that if uh, people have an idea of Christian faith being sort of a guarantee that nothing bad's going to happen and life's going to be all a bed of roses, then that's given you a wrong impression and a wrong understanding. And um, it's actually not fully biblical. It's kind of a part of the biblical revelation, not a, not a full biblical revelation. We want to see, well, that's why I always tell people, read through the whole Bible, not just your favorite verses. Read through the whole Bible because it'll give you a balanced perspective. And that's what I'm kind of preaching about here today, a balanced perspective. That's what we need. We need a right theology, right thinking, a right perspective of where we're at and what God promises us and what we can look forward to and so forth. See, understand me, God can absolutely do anything. Scripture tells us that. And when it's his will, he does amazing miracles. He sent an angel to open prison gates and get Peter out of prison one time. So he delivered him from that, you know. He sent an earthquake and he broke the chains and opened the prison doors when Paul was in prison one time. Another time, you know, Paul in the book of Acts, he was throwing some firewood on a fire and a snake bit him. And God neutralized the poison so he didn't suffer any harm. God can do those things, and he has done those things. There's a story of George Washington and the Revolutionary War that after a particular battle, I think it was Revolutionary War, it might have been the French and Indian Wars, but his coat had bullet holes in it, and he was just barely missed. And some Indian chief said, we fired at the man over and over and never could hit him. <clears throat> so God can do that. And there's the story about Abraham Lincoln riding back to the White House one night, and a bullet came through his top hat and took it off of his head, and he wasn't hurt. And God can do that. And so it's absolutely right to pray for protection from COVID-19 or other plagues. It's absolutely right. You can do that. I encourage that. But there are other things I believe we need to recognize in the face of that, you know, in the face of this pandemic. Because you got to see the other side of what Scripture teaches. Scripture says that God got Peter out of prison one time. But Jesus also told Peter that when he was old, he would be taken out and crucified, basically. And we know from church history, that's what happened. He was crucified, you know, uh, upside down. Jesus predicted that. We know that Paul got out of prison that time when there was an earthquake in Acts 16. But we also know from church history, he was later beheaded by the Emperor Nero. <laughs> Washington eventually died. Abraham Lincoln was delivered from the bullet that one night, but later he was shot in the head and assassinated. Scripture has promises of blessing and protection, but also, look, guys, you got to read it all. Many believers, like Hebrews 11 tells us in the famous Hall of Faith, many believers were delivered miraculously, but others went through persecution and suffering and wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins and lived in mountains and, and caves and dens of the, of the earth and out in the desert and so forth. The history of the church is a history of supernatural deliverances, yeah, but also of persecution, of exile, of martyrdom. In the Psalms, we get a really basic, uh, a really balanced view of things. And that's why it's really good to read through the Psalms because 
They cover the range of human emotion and experience. You have wonderful psalms where surely goodness and mercy will, do, will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yet yeah, there are wonderful uh, expressions of thanksgiving for good times and all. But you also have lots of psalms that express grief and doubt and where the psalmist even complains to God and says, how long, O Lord, you know, are you going to leave me like this? And my tears have just watered my couch at night. You know, I've just been crying so much and I cry out to you and where are you? So that's why you need to read all the scripture because you get a more balanced view. And that's what we need in times like these. We don't want to believe in Pollyannish platitudes or fairy tales. We want to know the truth. You know, I want the truth, like the movie says. You can't handle the truth. Yes, we can. We need the truth. The truth will set us free. The truth will help us to be stable and solid and, and hopeful and understand what we can look for. See? And so that's what I'm trying to get out here today. So in the verse I quoted from John 16, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of a good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want you to notice the context of that because um, what was the context? Well, it was in the upper room just before Jesus was arrested and put on trial and then crucified. So he himself, he himself spoke that verse in the world you'll have tribulation when he was facing the greatest trial of his life. Think about it. He was about to be betrayed by a close friend, Judas. He was going to be arrested, falsely accused, mistreated by Jewish religious authorities, beaten, slapped, spit upon, and mocked. He was going to be insulted and humiliated, and then scourged and crucified, tortured to death. Now, you say, yeah, but that was for our sins. He did all that for us. We don't have to go through that. Well, that's true. He did suffer all that in a redemptive way to provide for our salvation. That's absolutely true. But nevertheless, think about this. Jesus is also an example for us. We're to follow him, right? And he teaches us about all kinds of aspects of life. And so there, when you see what Jesus went through, I want you to think about it this way. This was a totally innocent and righteous man. He loved God perfectly, and he always obeyed God. He was the only truly and fully good human being that's ever lived. And yet, look how he was treated. Look what he went through. He prayed for the cup to pass from him, but the father made it clear to him, no, it's not going to be. You have to drink of this cup. And so I think that's something for us to think about, that you can be a godly person doing exactly what God wants you to do and yet go through great difficulties. Jesus teaches that. And it was in that context, on that night, that he told his disciples they would have tribulation in the world too. He himself was going through it and he was about to go through far more. He said that even they would forsake and abandon him. Even his friends would abandon him. Think about it, see? Anytime you feel like you've been betrayed or abandoned or forsaken, think about it. Jesus has been through it. He knows what it's like and he was totally innocent. He didn't do anything wrong to deserve it. But I want you to notice two things that he also said. He said, number one, you're going to leave me alone, but I'm not alone. Why? For the Father is always with me. That's John 16, 32. So he, he knew that God was with him in the midst of whatever. And he also said, be of good cheer. And the Amplified Bible says, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for... I have overcome the world. And again, the Amplified says, I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Wow. See? So when we think about what are we supposed to do in these times that we're in, these times of shaking, I think it's important to not have a false hope. You know, our pastor could never get sick because he's a Christian and he believes in God and God's going to protect him. We shouldn't have a false hope. We shouldn't have believe in platitudes. Our president won the election. He's going to win. He can't lose because we all prayed and we're Christians and we prayed and God has to answer our prayers. 
See, we need to have not a false hope, but a solid hope in the real things that God promises. When people tell me, oh, things will be all right, I'm afraid that doesn't really encourage me a lot of times. Because I know that they don't know that. Everything's going to be all right. Really? You can't prove that. Now, you know, say they're experts on a particular thing that I'm worried about, and they tell me, you know, like I'm working on my car right now. It's broken down. We got it completely apart. This Baptist pastor friend of mine is helping me, and we've got it completely apart. And I'm pretty dubious. Like, I don't, I don't know if I can get this thing. I said, are you think we're going to ever get this thing back together? He says, listen, I've never lost a case. Once I get them, I get them broken down, I'll get them back together. We'll get this motor back. So I, I trust him because he, he has that experience that I don't have. You know, so in that kind of case, I believe him. But when people just tell me, oh, it's going to be all right. Things are going to be better. The world's going to be better. This is going to be the greatest year ever. Well, then it doesn't encourage me that much because I, I just know they don't know anything more than I do. And so I prefer the way Jesus gives comfort. It's not a platitude. It's not pie in the sky. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a dream or a delu delusion. It's based on reality. That's what that uh, John 16 verse shows me. He was going through it right then. He was going through the lake of fire, if you will, right then. He was going through hell right then. He knows what this world's like. He's walked the, these dusty trails. He's been tired. He's been uh, mistreated. He's suffered. He's, he's struggled like we have. And so he knows about the difficulties and the pressures and the suffering and the fear and the uncertainty and so forth. He we can relate to him because he is related to us. And he doesn't deny reality or tell us these things aren't real. He tells us God is with us. And that's the important thing. That's the comfort. God's with us. God understands what we're going through. So we're not alone. And he's telling us that he's been through these things and He's not going to allow anything to happen to us, but what God allows, what has gone through God's hands, so, so to speak, through God's filter. And what God allows us to suffer, we got to trust that there's an eternal purpose behind it. We may not understand what that is, but we can trust in him, right? He has overcome this world. He has taken away the sting of things like death. Now, sometime back, I was doing a Bible study, and a person asked me a question about 1 Corinthians 15, 19, where Paul said that if only in this life we have hope in Christ, then we're of all people to be most pitied. So this person asked me, why would he say that we Christians are the people who should be most pitied if, if, if we only have hope in this life? And uh, she thought that seemed strange, like we're to be really pitied. We're the apostles of Christ. If, if there's no resurrection, man, we really are to be more pitied than anybody. And so I was explaining to her that Paul went through horrendous persecution, horrendous difficulty for the cause of Christ. He tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, some of the things he went through, he was shipwrecked three times. He was often poor and hungry and without even having proper clothing for the weather. He was many times beaten, imprisoned. He was hated. He, he, he uh, encountered stiff opposition and hatred and rejection by his own people. His life was actually very difficult. And folks, I want you to think about it. His life as a Christian was more difficult than his life as a non-Christian. Have you ever thought of that? Accepting Christ didn't give him a bed of roses. Accepting Christ actually made life more challenging for him. And so what he was saying in that verse in 1 Corinthians, we're to be most pitied, is that um, if this life is all there is, then we're to be the most pitied. But he knew this life was not all there is. See, he would have really been, you could have said he made the wrong choice accepting Christ if this life is all it is, there is, because when he accepted Christ, things got difficult for him. But he didn't make a wrong choice because this life is not all there is. And he knew that. Jesus redeemed us. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus paid for our sins. He reconciled us to God. He loved us so much, as his father did, that he suffered so we wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And like, and like him, 
Paul had a lot of tribulations. Jesus went through them. Paul went through them. He wasn't protected from all the difficulties of life by any means. He actually faced more than most people. But he knew God was with him and that someday he was going to be with God forever and ever. Jesus had overcome the world for him. And so he knew that whatever he went through, there was some purpose to it. And God was going to work out things for good through it. That's what I think we need to remember in times like these. We can't promise there won't be sickness, that we won't lose loved ones. Hey, you know, you got to read history. You need to read through the whole Bible, but I also encourage people, read history. It'll help you. I was reading a quote from Martin Luther some time back, and, you know, he lived during the time of bubonic plague in Europe. And uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read about people who had tough times, it kind of encourages me. Maybe I have a perverse sort of, uh, of, uh, per, of uh, I get encouragement from a strange source. But for me, it's encouraging to hear that others have had it far worse. I think the COVID-19 thing is bad. Man, it's nothing like the bubonic plague. It killed, that plague killed millions. Whole cities were wiped out. Did you know that 100,000 Franciscan monks died during it? And they were they died because they were serving people, trying to help the sick and, and the poor and so forth. In Christ's name, 100,000 Franciscan monks, they died. Tell me God won't allow any trials or difficulties or sicknesses to come upon believers. Tell me about it. When you, when, when you read about the difficulties that others have gone through, there's been plagues before, folks. There's been wars before. Did you know the end of the world has come before? Yeah, we think this is the end of the world. These got to be the last days, right, Pastor? We're in the last days. Folks, the Bible says we've been in the last days since Jesus rose and went and ascended back to heaven. Did you know that? What do you think it was like to be in Jerusalem in 70 AD when the Romans crushed it? That was the end of the age in, G in their minds. The end of the world. What do you think it was like in the 400s AD when Rome fell and many Christians were there and they, they were just overrun by these different barbaric hordes. What do you think it was like in 1453 when the Christian capital of the world, Constantinople, was taken by the Muslims? It was the end of the world. There's been lots of ends of the world, lots of plagues, lots of wars, lots of calamities, and Christians have gone through them. We need that understanding. But there's one more thing I want to mention and bring out that I believe that we need to remember in times like this. And that's this point. Times of crisis can serve a good purpose if we can just get our eyes opened to see it. What's that good purpose? Well, I'll tell you, look, times of crisis make us more aware of our own mortality and the fallenness of this world. You know that? Have you noticed that? They make you more aware of your own mortality. I just had a, my knee go out. For a month, I've been hobbling, and now it's slowly getting better. And it, boy, I realized how much I appreciate being able to walk, you know, because I lost it for a while. And I didn't realize what a, what a benefit and a blessing it was to be able to walk until I couldn't walk. And so often in life, we're just busy with all these frivialities and different, you know, superficial things in our and our phones and our computers and our business and this and that. We're just all occupied and happy-go-lucky and all. And a time of shaking like this, a time of crisis, all of a sudden wakes you up and, and tells you, hey, you know what? This world has fallen. It's not going to last forever. And, and we're not going to last forever. We're mortal. We're, we're, we're vulnerable. We're, fra we're fragile. This world isn't heaven. It's not our home. We shouldn't get too comfortable here. James says that our life is but a vapor. And there's a hymn I like that says, We blossom and flourish like leaves on a tree, then we wither and perish, but not changeth thee. So shaking makes you see how vulnerable you are and how transitory life is. And that's a good thing. It wakes us up. In Luke 13, which I read this morning, Jesus mentioned that uh, there were these different calamities that the people of his time were aware of. And he said, do you think that those people went through the, that suffering and all because they were worse sinners than everybody else? He said, I'm telling you, no, they weren't. Those kind of things just happen in life. But he said, unless you repent, you'll all perish. Just, you know, because we're all perishing. 
So it's not just the victims of terrorism or COVID-19 who are perishing. We're all perishing. Evangelists always say we're in a dying world. This is a dying world. When I was younger, I used to think, why do they say that? A dying world. It's not dying. Well, yeah, it is. The older I get, the more I see it is. Yeah, it is. It's a dying world. We're all dying. We are born and we begin dying. And the older you get, the closer you realize death is. You know, you're coming close to the door there. And so the worldwide pandemic is evidence. Look, look, we all have a disease that's killing us. It's sin. And so if COVID gets you or not, you're still dying. The truth is that the world is already plagued with the worst disease of all. And we're separated from God and dying. And so this plague can make us more aware of that, more aware of our vulnerability and our fragility. It makes me uh, I'm aware of something I often say at funerals. I, you know, you'll see this on a plaque sometimes. It says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's just so true. Another thing I often say at funerals that this pandemic reminds me of is we should all truly want to be alive, of, of course, right? We want to be alive. We don't want to be struck with the pandemic and die or something. We want to be alive. But I always tell people, if you want to be truly alive, look at that word alive, A-L-I-V-E, as an acrostic. If you want to be truly alive, you need to always live in view of eternity. Always live in view of eternity. That makes you truly alive. And so, we're facing cri crisis and terrible times. If you're a conservative like me, you probably feel depressed about the elections too and the direction the new administration's taken us. But I think even that can serve a useful purpose. You know, I've been thinking about it. It, it can get our eyes off of government or get, get our hopes off of government and get us more focused on God alone. God's our only hope, fo folks. He's our hope. And so... Uh, please understand me as I wrap up. I'm not saying let's be uh, fatalists and just say, hey, God sent this virus, you know, or God has taken us in these bad directions that our government is leading us now. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying be passive and just let it happen and, you know, don't fight against it. I think we should fight against the sickness, get the, our vaccinations, whatever. And we should be praying for our country and our government and our society to not go the wrong way, but to go the right way. But I do believe that all these calamities can serve a purpose because God said he was going to shake heaven and earth. And I think that's what's happening and it's meant to wake us up. God disciplines whole nations, not just individuals. He's shaking this world so that we might see our need of something unshakable, our need of God. And I'll tell you what let's do. Let's be praying that God uses these things for exactly that, that, that people wake up. Let's pray for revival. That's what it means to awaken. Let's pray for revival. That God would open us, open our eyes as Christians, that we would get our eyes off shake, shakeable things, transient things, and look to the permanent thing. To get our eyes on the Lord. To learn how to stand in faith. To learn how to trust in Him. To look to Him to lead us, right? To do all we can to prepare ourselves, right? And here's my last verse that I want to end with. 1 Peter 3.15 in, in the midst of persecution and all, Peter said, be ready always. He said, sanctify Christ in your hearts. Set him apart as Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer for the hope that's in you and do it with gentleness and respect. And so he wrote that to them. He said, when you suffer and all, set apart Christ in your hearts as holy. Sanctify Christ in your hearts and be ready to give an answer. That's what we need to do. Focus on our relationship with God. Live for God, live in deeper relationship. Let it, let it drive you deeper in Christ. Let your roots go deep during the time of crisis and difficulty and all that. Spend more time in God's word and more time in prayer, and more time focusing yourself on him so that you can be better prepared and ready to give an answer to the people of this world. They don't have any hope. We do. We go through the crisis just as they do, but we know this world is not our home. There's a better one coming. We know God can use everything for good purpose. And so we have someone who's with us to strengthen and encourage us. I hope that that encourages you today and helps you to have a, maybe a, a little clearer perspective on things that we're going through in this time. Again, I want to thank Pastor Bob for inviting me to share with you. And if you'd like to write any comments or prayer requests to me, I'd, be wel I'd welcome them. I'd be happy to hear from you and 
I just pray that this message will be a blessing to you. Let me pray for you as I close. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have not given us Pollyannish platitudes that say that life's going to be great if we accept Christ and there'll never be any problems. But you've told us the truth, the way things really are. And yet you promised to always be with us through whatever comes and that you would enable us to overcome and do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We thank you for this, Lord, your promise and your presence. We ask that you would help us navigate these difficult times by keeping our eyes on you, by going deeper in your word and, and in prayer, and that you would help us to prepare ourselves, Lord, so that we might always be ready to give an answer to those who ask us of the hope that's within us. We thank you, Lord, that in this world we do have tribulation and distress and difficulties, but we can be of good cheer because... You have overcome the world and you've made us more than overcomers, more than conquerors through your son, the Lord Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.